Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the Physics Connection. In this week's q and I'm going to talk about imaginary time, entropy, and negative temperature. So, let's start with entropy. So, the first question is, what is entropy and does it always go up? Well, entropy is a measure of the number of possible ways that the system can be in. So, if I'm uh, sitting here, my position in the room could be here, could be there, could be there, could be there. I could be moving at 100 meters per second, 200 meters per second. I'd be stopped. I could be moving this way, that way. So the collection of all possible positions and all possible velocities that I can have, if you kind of measure the area of that um, possibility space, then that would give you a measure of entropy. So what did I mean? What is area? Well, it's a tough concept to think about, but let's say well, there's a particle in a box, and the particle is moving around, and you want to know what its entropy is, or what's the entropy of that gas. Well, that is basically the number of ways that you can rearrange the particle inside the box. And so, the, the particle could have positions, say, from here to here, if the... Uh, Let's say the box is like this, one meter by one meter by one meter. The volume of the box is obviously a measure of the number of positions that the particle can be in. It could be here, 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 could be here. So these are the possible uh, positions that the particle can have. There's also, this is in position space, but there's also a similar box in velocity or momentum space. The, the box would be from zero to say the maximum velocity, let's call that V max, could be 100 meters per second inside the gas depending on the temperature. And there's, so it could be in the x direction the velocity, could be here, and it could be in the y direction. So this defines a box in velocity space as well for example, and then the volume of this box times this box is the total volume that the particle can occupy and that gives you a measure of the number of ways that the particle can be in. And so what does this have to do with thermodynamics? Why, for example, this, just this fact tells you why a particle can go from a hot gas or why energy flows from a hot gas to a cold gas. And the reason that is is that when that energy flows to the colder gas, like it starts shaking the molecules of the uh, colder gas where that, that were moving very slow. The box in velocity space of the cold gas was very tiny. So there was not a lot of possibilities that these molecules can do. They're just trapped in a box. But when energy flows, you blow up this box and you all of a sudden have more possible ways that the particles can be moving. They can be moving this way, that way, at a very high speed, at a very low speed. They could be here, there, there. So when you add, when the energy flows to the colder gas, you blow up this uh, uh, box and you get more possibilities. And because there's more possibilities, then it's more likely to happen. So let's take an example from the real world. or Not really the real world, but let's say in our world there's one person who has purple eyes. Now this person, uh, you don't know where he lives, you don't know what, everyone else has normal eyes, but whenever someone knocks the door, you think, what is the pro probability that this person is going to have uh, purple eyes? Well, the probability is very low. Of course, unless you happen to be the one that, the, who is living with that person, then the probability is high. But unless you're in that spe sp specific special situation that you started in, unless you had special initial conditions, then whoever knocks on the door is probably going to have normal eyes. And that's why whenever you put two gases together, similarly, the hot gas will flow into the cold gas just because it's more probable. That's, there's more ways for that to happen than for the cold gas to lose its already small energy. So that's entropy and that's why it's always increasing. It's simply because it's more probable that it increases. And when you want to ask, why does a hot gas, when you put it in front of a cold gas, why does it lose its energy? Well, just because there's more ways for it to lose the energy than to get energy from the 
cold gas that didn't really have that much energy to begin with. Okay, so this is a nice segue to the second question, which is what is negative temperature and how can you get to that negative temperature? So again, like most things, just, this is just a matter of definition. What is a cold temperature depends on what is temperature in the first place. What do you mean by temperature? Temperature actually, the way it's defined in statistical physics is related to this concept, is how much do you blow up this area or this box in velocity space or in uh, number of possibility space. So what temperature is, it t what temperature tells you is how much does this box expand when you add some amount of energy. So if I add some energy to some system, it's obviously gonna, some of its particle will be able to move faster. And so there will be more possibilities for that. And there will be more possibilities for that to happen. And as I just said, that's why the hot gas loses its, its energy, because there's more possibilities for that to happen. And so, when you pump energy into that uh, smaller box, there is all of a sudden more possibilities in it. So temperature basically tells you that how much will the, bus, will the box increase when I add energy in it. If the box will not increase when you add energy then the temperature is very low and if the box will actually decrease if you add energy then the temperature is negative but how can a box dec decrease how can I add energy and w in a box where the particles are moving if I gave them energy then they could really move really fast well th there's the trick you actually the, the particles in this uh, experiment where people made the negative temperature they're not really considering the motion of the particles and they're not allowing them to move so what you have actually is one particle that could be in a low energy state this is low energy and then there's another state that is high energy so there's a lot of these states and a lot of these states in a bunch of particles now when I start at zero temperature all the particles are here and this entire space is filled there's three of them and three is a field so there's nothing else you can do but then what you do is I add some energy and one is here but because I added now look there's three here there's three possibilities where I could put this particle one two three so all of a sudden I increase the number of uh, possibilities so the temperature is uh, becoming bigger then I put it here okay then now there's the same number of possibilities so the temperature is zero at this point it's back to zero and then when I put it back here the number of possibilities again there's just three and I can't put any more so the number of possibilities has stopped I can't add energy to this system and that's why you say the, ne the temperature is negative just because there's not a lot of spaces that you can increase energy to so it's this weird situation where you decided to ignore the velocity, the motion, and imagine that they're fixed at sites. One is high energy, one is low energy. And so there's a bunch of particles at the low energy, and you keep giving them energy, and they keep occupying the higher energy states. But when they occupy this entire thing, when this thing start, starts to become completely occupied, well, there's not a lot of places that you can add things. So the space of possibilities doesn't increase when you add the energy and therefore the end, the, this box is like it's um, not expanding but contracting and that gives you the negative temperature so it's just a matter of definition it's just a matter of probability when you add energy did you get more possibilities or less possibilities if you get less possibilities in your situation then it's a negative temperature but that doesn't mean really that in the real world it's going to be a negative temperature or that it's going to be very, very cold. In fact, it could be the opposite. It could be that you, you will, when you touch it, you will not give it your energy. You will take energy from it. Okay, so that's the second question. The third question is what is imaginary time? Again, this is a matter of definition. What is imaginary time? Well. To understand what an imaginary time, you need to understand what an imaginary number is. An imaginary number is a number when you square it, it gives you a negative sign. But you already know f 
from uh, high school that if you square a number, let's say like you square minus 2, you will get 4. You square, square 2, you also get 4. Any number that you square is going to give you a positive number. But I just told you how c that you can get a negative number when you square something. Well, that's why we call it imaginary number because it's not a real number the numbers that we're used to in when we picture things that it's not like a length but it's an abstract mathematical object that you can define you can just say there's this thing well actually I'm gonna call it I when I square it I get minus one I just defined it like that it's the solution to this equation is called I and it's not a number that you can imagine or write down like this it, that's why we call it imaginary number but it's not such a weird thing to do to define a number by an equation. If that's weird to you, remember how you define the square, the square root of 2. You define square root of 2 to be the number that when you square it gives you 2. Well, this is not an integer and you don't know what it is and it's irrational. You can't even write all the digits of it. So how do you know it exists? You just say, well, I define it. It's just the number that when I square it gives me 2. And so you define a number, an object to be the solution to this equation. Okay, so just like you define the square root of 2, you can define the imaginary number. So where does imaginary time come in? So this is going to bring us into Einstein's theory a little bit. So let's think first about this pen. What is its length? If I put it like this, the length it's gonna have, it's gonna be like that, and it's gonna have an x component, which is x, and a y component, which is y, and the length of this, let's say L, the length squared is going to be equal by Pythagorean theorem to be y squared plus x squared. Okay? And if it's in three dimensions, you can say plus z squared. And I'm going to make it even more interesting. If it's in four dimensions, it's going to be plus t squared. Okay? It's just for every dimension, it just this squared plus that squared plus that squared gives you the length. And again, this is a definition of a length. But it's something that makes sense to us. It's how long this thing is. So, another fact that defines the space is that this length doesn't matter in which direction I orient it. If I have the pen like this, same length. Like this, same length. Like that, same length. I can direct it in any way, and it gives you the same length. And that's a consequence of this definition. This definition doesn't change with rotation. Okay, I can take this whole thing and rotate it and it gives me the same answer. So I can evaluate it in any coordinate system, whether I rotate it that way, that way, that way, that way. Okay? So what does this have to do with time? Well, Einstein's theory of relativity tells you that there is this other thing, maybe let's call it L squared, this is the thing that is invariant in Einstein's theory. This is the thing that uh, tells you that the light moves at a fixed speed and it also tells you that uh, and it also gives you all the consequences of Einstein's theory. So if I do this, this is the definition of it. It's the same x squared plus y squared plus z squared and then minus t squared. So with any between any two points if you measure the coordinates of it, the x, y, z, and the time of each uh, coordinate, and then you square each uh, of the coordinates, and then you subtract the time squared of that, the answer that you will get will not depend on whether you're sitting still over here or moving in a rocket at half the speed of light. You will get the same thing for those two events. So this is the thing that is invariant in Einstein's theory, and this is the thing that defines it. So, look at how these things are similar. It's as if Einstein's theory is telling you that this interval between two things is like a length, except it's in a four-dimensional space, and this thing is rotationally invariant in that four-dimensional space. But it's even more complicated than that because of this minus sign. But here's where imaginary time comes in. If we say, oh, let's go to imaginary time. And that this is just purely a, ma purely a mathematical trick. You say, oh, this time is actually imaginary. It's i, remember, this minus 1, uh, when you square it, 
times capital T. This is the definition of capital T. So now L squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus t squared. Now, this is the point. When you go to imaginary time, Einstein's theory just becomes rotational invariant. It becomes just like saying, wherever I look, this pen has the same length. And that's it. It's just a mathematical trick to relate rotation to Einstein's theory. Okay, thank you for watching, and I will see you next week. And please leave your questions in the comment section. I will answer them for you next week.